Wow, well, Merry Christmas to you. What an amazing celebration that we have going on here. That this is the reason uh, for this night, isn't it? That this is the night that we come together and celebrate the greatest news ever given in the history of the world. That when it comes to news, news has power, doesn't it? Like news has the power to awaken hope. The right kind of news can, can absolutely change the entire perspective that we have when it comes to this world, can't it? For example, in the movie Unbroken, there's this very memorable scene. And if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, Unbroken is about the heroic story of Louis Zapparini. He is this uh, uh, American Olympian who ultimately goes to war in World War II and becomes uh, an American POW in Japan at one of the prison camps there. And there's about 700 POWs lined up. And they're lined up there, and they're, they're sitting there, and they're kind of sickly looking. They are uh, discouraged. They're kind of beaten down. They're all wondering if, if, this, if they're ever going to see home again. And as they're standing there in the line, the Japanese prison commander steps up onto the air raid platform. And, you know, he has, he has the white gloves on his hands. He has the sword on his hip, the, the uh, gun on his other hip. And he begins to speak, and he looks out at the POWs lined up, and he says to them, the war has come to a place of cessation. And because of our great nation, Japan, we invite you to all go and bathe in the Hakora River. As the American POW standing next to the commander is translating this for all of the, all of the people there, There's this deafening silence that falls over the men standing in the line until one of them says what everyone else is thinking. The guy standing next to Louie looks at him and says, this is it, we're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. At that point, the lines begin to break up and the men are led by gunpoint down through the camp, under the bridge and and into the river. They get into the water and, and as they all begin to spread out, they begin to wash their skin with the soot and the dust and the dirt that was on them, all wondering what's gonna happen next. And, and then they hear it, the low rumble of an aircraft, loud and huge coming right at them. They look up into the skies, not able to find it, wondering where it's at, the overcast skies. Eventually it breaks out of the clouds and they see that it's a torpedo bomber. It's heading right to them, toward them. It dives down to the water level, kind of skims out, levels out, skims across the water. And many of them are thinking, this is it. This is the way we're going out. As the aircraft comes over top of them, they see on the belly and and on the wings the bright white star encircled in the blue. And they realize in that moment that it's it's not a Japanese bomber, that this is an American bomber. On the side of the bomber is this this red signal thing that's like going crazy. And it's, it's relaying a signal to the men. And one of the airmen that is standing in the water looks up and he's able to decode it. And he goes, oh, the war is over. The war is over. And the men, they they throw their arms up in triumph. They survive. Rescue's on the way. Liberation is, is happening. News like that is powerful. News like that brings hope. And it's news like that that brings such power to the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 2, uh, we have the story of Jesus' birth, that Jesus is born of, of Mary. She, she has him in this manger because there's no place for him in the inn. And, and he, he lays them, he lays them there. And as Jesus is, is born, the angels go out beginning to proclaim the message into the world. They, they arrive on a hillside to a couple of shepherds and they look at the shepherds and they say these words, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In many ways, spiritually speaking, we are a lot like those American POWs. We're sickened because of our sins. We're held captive by our great enemy, and we are all sentenced to death. That we as humans are in great need, desperate need, desperate need of some good news of great joy. And in this moment in history, news breaks forth, news that that changes everything, that changed everything. A little later on in Hebrews chapter 2, the author of Hebrews is trying to help us understand like why this news is so good, why this news is so is so great and why it's for all people. And he walks down and he begins to explain it to us in such a way that that we're able to see. Now, when it comes to Hebrews chapter 2, we don't oftentimes think of this as like a Christmas verse, but it totally is. As the writer is is explaining why this is good news, it's like buckle up, here we go. Here's what he has to say. 
Starting in verse 14, he starts off a little odd. He says this, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. Now, just so you're aware that when he's talking children, that's shorthand for, for children of God. And what he's saying here is that with Jesus is coming into this, into the world, that God now has the salvation of his children in view. That now the view of salvation is there for people. See, the reality is that every single one of us has sinned. We've all sinned, and God, as he's sitting up in heaven watching over the earth that he created, sees the sin of this world. He sees the sin that is in me. He sees the sin that is in you. And he watches its effects on us. He watches as it sickens us to the point of death. He watches how it steals from us the things that we long for most, things like hope and peace, love and joy. Most importantly, he watches how sin separates us from our creator, our God. And as he watches the darkness of of sin overtake the creation that he made, he's not sitting in heaven with a frown on his face, but rather he sees it with the compassion of a father's heart. And he loves us too much to keep us there. For God so loved me, for God so loved you, for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. That at Christmas, Jesus begin, or God begins to reveal the grand plan, his grand design for Jesus coming into the world. That Jesus came so that we might experience what it looks like, what it feels like, what it is to be his children, to be adopted in his family. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, that being Jesus himself, likewise took part of the same things. That that simply what this means is that that Jesus took on flesh and blood. That is, that Jesus is human. That God, sitting in his throne room in heaven, could not die for sin. But as a man, he could, and as a man, he did. Listen, Good Friday is the reason and the purpose for Christmas that Jesus came, Jesus came as flesh and blood, partaking in the same thing. God 100%, man 100%. It's the great mystery of our faith, the great mystery of our faith, and yet the core of our faith that Jesus came. He came as human so that through death, that Jesus came to die, like, like I said, that, that the reason for Christmas is Good Friday. That as God, he could not die for sin, but as man, he could. That he came so that he might die, and in dying, that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Whether you believe it or not, whether you want to admit it or not, whether you know it or not, you have an enemy. And that enemy has you captive. That he has you captive because of, your, because of your sin. See, he does not care one ounce for you. He does not have any empathy for you. That he wields a weapon that he holds over your head. And the weapon that he wields over your head is your sin. That by your sin you are accused. By your sin you are, you are guilty and, and feel shame. By your sin you are kept in the prison and captivity of your own making. And in Jesus' death, he, he comes, he comes, and he disarms the weapon from the enemy that, that in death, Jesus literally takes out of the enemy's hands the only weapon that he has. And so we have the, the constant accuser stumbling, stumbling as he tries to make a case against you, unable to, because you've been cleared by the death of Jesus. One of my favorite songs is by a group named, named Shane and Shane. They're this acoustic band, a worship band, and they wrote this beautiful song called Embracing Accusations. It's not really a Christmas song, although maybe we should sing it for Christmas. It's really a song about our redemption, about our salvation, and and it talks about this reality. Listen to the lyrics. It says, the father of lies coming to steal, kill, and destroy. All my hopes of being good enough, I hear him saying, cursed are the ones who can't abide. He's right. Hallelujah, he's right. The devil, he's preaching the song of the redeemed, that I am cursed and I've gone astray, that I cannot gain salvation, embracing accusation. 
Oh, the devil singing over me an age old song that I am cursed and gone astray. Singing the first verse so conveniently over me, he's forgotten the refrain, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. See, the good news of great joy is that Jesus, that baby, laying in a manger, is the one who saves. He saves. And according to verse 15, as he saves, he also delivers all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong savory. In other words, this is the, the red signal light going off on the side of the bomber. We decode it and it says the war is over. The war is over. You are free. That because of Jesus' death, your guilt and shame have been pushed to the side. Because of Jesus' death, your sin is covered and you have a perfect righteousness that is now yours because of Jesus. That through him, through Jesus' death, he gives himself over to the ruler of death. And yet we find that the grave cannot hold him. That on the third day, Jesus comes walking out of the valley of death. He is alive. He's alive. And in the resurrection comes the promise to those who believe to those who have trusted in him as, as Savior, as Messiah, to those who have, who have experienced him as one of his children, adopted into his family, that the promise given to us is that he too will raise us in victory, which means, which means that you don't have to have any more fear, that you don't have to fear the great enemy, that you don't have to fear death, that you don't have to fear anything because Christmas has come, Jesus is here, and we raise with him in victory. That this is the good news of great joy that we celebrate this Christmas Eve. For when the angels say, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. For unto you on this day a child is born in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Now I want you to think about what's about to happen next. That in a few moments after my prayer, we're going to celebrate and participate in an age-old tradition of, of lighting candles. In your house, maybe the, the room can become dark. Here, the, the lights will dim. And this signifies to us the darkness of this world, the darkness of my soul. And we have the one flickering light, the, the light of the Christ candle. And with the, the light of the Christ candle, we, we will take our candle and we'll light from it as a as a signal that Christ is the light of the world. That he is the savior that came into the darkness on that silent night some 2,000 years ago. And a savior through his death, as he clothes himself in humanity, he allows us to experience in freedom the things that we long for like hope and peace love and joy, we get to experience what it's like to be free. And so tonight, there may be some of you out there who would love to know what it looks like to be in relationship with this Jesus, this, this one who saves, this one who liberates, the one that we celebrate tonight. If that's you, we're, gonna, we're just going to use our text line. We're going to make it easy. You've already seen it once, but, but you can see it again. It's 720-513-1933. And if you simply text the name of Jesus, we'll get back with you this week. I want you to think about for a moment with me what's going to happen next. In a few moments, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to join in an age-old tradition that millions, if not billions, will be participating in around the world on this day. That the tradition that we step into is we darken the lights in our house and, and in this room. And as the lights darken, it, it represents the sin of the worlds. It represents the darkness of our, of our soul. The one light that is lit is, is the light of the Christ candle. 
And we, we take our candles and we light our candles from, from the Christ candle, representing the love and the hope, the joy and the peace that we're able to experience as those who walk as free, children adopted by God. As we pass it from person to person, as we hold the light above our head, what we're declaring in celebration is the greatest news given ever to this world. That Jesus came as a baby, born in a stable, laid in a manger, so that one day that he would grow up and that he would die for the sins of the world, freeing them. Before I pray, I want to just give you a quick word of warning in your home tonight if you're lighting candles, is you always want to keep the flame up. If you have a, a non-flamed candle, you put that into the flame. That way we keep everybody from, from becoming one of the Fantastic Four members tonight, all right? Let me pray. Jesus, we come before you. Lord, humbled, completely in awe of who you are, of what you came to do. It's amazing to me that, that you stepped out of heaven, that you clothed your divinity with humanity to live a life that ultimately was to lead to death so that we might be free. And so tonight we celebrate you we remember that silent night some 2,000 years ago when you were born into this world. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Ten.